Hello, everyone. Welcome to Insider Risk Community virtual event for May, IP theft, cost, and impact. My name is Matt Rabley, and I will be your host today. So for those of you who are not familiar with uh, this event, um, if you are not, we are, um, we've gotten together kind of in the insider risk community to bring together practitioners and professionals from security and risk community who really understand the need to balance collaboration, productivity, and enablement of users while meeting kind of the security challenge that, is, that exists out there. We recognized actually that there needed to be education around these insider risk problems. So we created these monthly events um, to facilitate that conversation. We have uh, today, we have today, there we go. We have today three really exciting panelists because we're focusing on IP theft in this environment. So we have Greg Bombard joining us from Greenberg Traurig. He's a partner and shareholder and has litigated these kinds of activities and these kinds of events. We also have with us David Huberman, who's the general counsel for Code 42, and then also Eric Ewald, who has been on both the practitioner side and also today on the advisory side with Booz Allen as a senior engineer and senior associate for Booz Allen. So let me just walk us through kind of what the agenda is gonna look like. So first we're gonna have Greg and David talk about kind of the legal perspective on IP theft and look at what that means and the kinds of things and how corporate councils should be participating and working with the security practitioners. And then we're going to bring on um, uh, Eric, who's going to look at it from a from a practitioner's perspective. And then at the end, all three of these gentlemen will join us in a in a Q and A. So during this time frame, if you look, feel free to enter any questions that you'd like, and uh, we'll we'll bring them into the conversation at the end of the event. So please participate if you can. And I'd like to bring on Greg and David. Good morning. Hi, everyone. Uh, David, you want to go first? I'll queue up the slides while you're talking. Sure. Hi, good morning, everyone. I'm David Huberman. I am the general counsel at Code42. And I am Greg Bombard. I am uh, a partner at Greenberg Traurig. My practice is entirely in trade secret litigation um, and some trade secret protection. So the perspective that David and I are bringing to this is the perspective of the lawyers, uh, both in-house counsel from David's perspective and uh, outside counsel from my perspective, the litigation perspective. What we wanted to cover today is um, a few things. One is to talk about the legal protections that exist for data and intellectual property that is kept uh, as confidential information or as a secret. So we'll talk about what is a trade secret under federal law and state law. We'll talk about an overview of trade secret litigation uh, when you have to go and use the court system to enforce your IP rights. What does that look like? And then we'll talk about some practical steps that companies can take to protect trade secrets. We'll talk about that from two perspectives. One is uh, what we're calling the legal approaches, things that lawyers and judges love to see, and then the things that uh, we're also calling the practical approaches, things that are very useful and effective at protecting trade secrets from being exfiltrated, um, and also, of course, are useful and helpful in litigation as well. Okay, let's jump in. So first up, we're talking about what is a trade secret? What is, what is uh, the legal protection for a company's confidential intellectual property? Here's the definition. This is drawn from the new-ish Federal Defend Trade Secrets Act, which was enacted in 2016. Um, that federal law mirrors state law in every state in the United States. So you have sort of two layers of protection with the same definition of what is a trade secret generally. First, it is all forms of information. It is an extraordinarily broad type of intellectual property protection. It's distinct 
from other types of IP like patents uh, or copyrights or trademarks in that it covers any type of information, whether it's written down, whether it is um, something that is just maintained in employees' memory. Um, and it has only a few other requirements. One is that it cannot be generally known or readily ascertainable. In other words, it has to be secret. It has to be confidential. And it can't be something that's easily reverse engineered. The holder of the trade secret, going a little bit out of order here, I apologize. The holder of the trade secret needs to have taken uh, reasonable measures to protect the confidentiality of the secret. We'll talk about that when we talk about the steps that companies can take to protect their trade secrets. And then finally, it has to have economic value, uh, which is an important distinguishing fact. There are, every company, every person has secret information, confidential information. But um, trade secrets are things that can be used for economic benefit, not just things that would be embarrassing if they got out. That's sort of the dividing line. If it would be embarrassing, we like to think of that as confidential business information or just confidential information. Uh, but if it has economic value, if it's valuable, like, for example, a process for manufacturing something, uh, that is that qualifies as a trade secret. So that's the general legal definition. Let's talk about, in practice, what types of things qualify for trade secret protection. Source code. This is a great common example of a trade secret. It is confidential. Once it's been compiled and sent to a, a user or a customer, it's not readily ascertainable by proper means. It's difficult to reverse engineer or it can't be reverse engineered. And as long as the holder of that source code has taken reasonable measures to protect its secrecy and the source code is economically valuable, that's, that source code can be a trade secret, can qualify for trade secret protection under both federal and state law. And then we have a whole list of other common things that are litigated in, the, in these types of cases. Customer lists are a common one. Um, things like manufacturing refinements or improvements um, product designs before the product is launched is another common trade secret, and so on and so on. This list ends with uh, et cetera intentionally here at the end because trade secret law is intentionally broad. It is meant to cover, as you saw on the prior slide, all forms of information. And so you can see on this slide how we go from something very technical like source code all the way down to things like business plans that are um, generally would be considered to be a little bit more squishy, something that is uh, not necessarily technical in nature, doesn't have to be technical to qualify for trade secret protection. Okay, now that we've talked about what qualifies as a trade secret or what is a trade secret, once the trade secret has been misappropriated, in other words, once it has been taken without permission, um, litigation is uh, a, a, a next likely event. And so let's talk about what litigation looks like in the context of a trade secret litigation. So this flowchart is meant to show uh, sort of the process from beginning to end of what a trade secret litigation would look like. The first thing in the upper left here is often an employee resignation. That's a triggering event in a lot of these cases. Many of these cases arise out of an employee moving from one company, taking confidential information on the way out, and then moving into a new company and using that information to unfairly compete with the employee's former employer. So often the triggering first event is an employee resignation. Then we've got here, uh, because it's particularly interesting to this group, um, incident detection. That These two things are not necessarily sequential, right? Obviously, it's possible that you could detect the, uh, the attempt or the beginning of an exfiltration of data before the employee resigns. Um, and of course, that's the goal, <laughs> to do that before the, uh, to close the barn door before the information walks out. Um, but in practice, as I think probably everyone knows, often the employee will resign before the employer becomes aware that any of that information has been uh, downloaded or taken out with the employee. 
Then often we, we see uh, forensic analysis. We come in and we start looking at um, where data has, has been moved by the employee. We, we can pull the employee, obviously we can pull the employee's machine if it's still available. We can look at forensics on the machine. We can look at email forensics. We can look at all sorts of data that will hopefully start to give a, a picture of where this employee used information, how they accessed it, where they transferred it. And that starts to provide some clues as to what the uh, former employee has been doing with the data. And then this proceeds into litigation in some cases. You might see a demand letter go uh, and ask the employee for certifications. Maybe it would remind the employee of their obligation to the former employer. Then um, in cases where we move into litigation, we file a lawsuit, then there may be some initial uh, procedural sparring around an injunction, something that would prevent that employee from working for the new company. Depending on how that injunction comes out, we then move into civil discovery. And that's when it all comes out. I mean, you, you've done your forensic analysis based on what, you, as a plaintiff, what you're readily able to get with respect to the employee's uh, computer, corporate issued computer. But civil discovery, uh, now you have the ability to demand forensics on the employee's personal computers. You have the ability to uh, ask questions under oath. And so um, whatever happened, all, the truth is going to come out in civil discovery. And then in a rare number of cases, we actually end up uh, going all the way to trial uh, where a jury often is going to be the decider as to whether information was exfiltrated and how it was used. This, this process is, is very long. Um, the typically, and this is just the median, by the way. This is across the country, the median time frame from the filing of a complaint. And so just to for context, this is now the second line here on this flow chart. This doesn't account at all for the top line. From filing a complaint to um to a either a trial in the end, that can take well over two years. Um, or the uh, from filing a complaint to getting to a point where a court is going to decide the issue uh, as a as a motion, right? So often that's the defendant saying you cannot prove that you took reasonable measures to protect your trade secret, and I want this case you know thrown out, and a judge may or may not agree. Uh, but even to get to that point, you're talking about well over well over a year. It's also very expensive. This chart, uh, based on a survey of in-house counsel, shows what in-house counsel expect to spend on a significant trade secret. Well, some of these are insignificant, but any type of trade secret litigation from insignificant all the way to very significant, depending on the amount at risk, the amount, the value of the alleged secret, litigation costs can run extremely high. So. When we're talking about litigation as a solution to data exfiltration, the takeaways here are a few. You know, one is it's extremely expensive, going backwards through these slides, it's extremely expensive, takes an extremely long time in the in the whole scheme of things. If we're talking about data walking out the door, waiting two years to get to trial is a very long time. And it's complicated. There, there's a lot of process. Uh, that goes into it. It's complicated and it can be an extreme distraction for the people who are involved, both on both sides, the plaintiff and the defense side, to deal with all of these issues, doing the forensic analysis, sparring with letters, and then going into real heavy duty litigation. Complicated, takes a long time, and it's very expensive. So, how do we avoid all of that? Um, and I'm going to ask Dave to sort of loop in and, and help me walk through now as we talk through the both legal and practical side of how to protect trade secrets in the first instance, how to avoid litigation. So here's a, a sort of graphical representation of what we're talking about in terms of avoiding litigation or in terms of protecting trade secrets. The idea here is you start at the top and the triangle is meant to show that at the top you have everybody is going to be, or, or a large swath of people are going to be subject to or um, 
uh, protect, you know, that you're going to attempt to protect trade secrets the most at the top and the least at the bottom. Hopefully that makes sense. So at the top, we have technology and process controls, obviously an important piece of this whole puzzle and something that should be applied to everybody, anybody who touches uh, confidential or trade secret information, there should be prote technological protections on that information. Then you have, for most employees, hopefully all employees, any partner of a business who is dealing with uh, a business's confidential information or trade secrets, they should be covered by non-disclosure agreements, legal agreements, not to disclose or use the information for any other purpose. And uh, a and in addition, that's sort of the legal side and the practical side of that slice of this triangle is compliance, ensuring a culture where employees and um, business partners and anybody who touches the secret information is aware of what their obligations are with respect to that information um, and is practicing, to, you know, doing good practices to ensure that that information does not leak out of the company. Then for, a, for some employees, depending on jurisdiction and depending on importance of the employee, they might be subject to what we call restrictive covenants. Those are non-compete agreements that would prevent an employee from going to a, a competing company for some defined period of time after employment, um, non-solicitation agreements that would prohibit employees from calling on their old customers or calling on or trying to hire their former colleagues, et cetera. And then, then we sort of get into the process slide that we saw earlier. In some cases, th there's some reason for concern. And so you end up doing reminder letters or demanding certifications from former employees. And then you hope that in the very rarest of cases, or, or maybe never, you get to the very bottom of this triangle. And that if all else fails, if all of these other things fail, and the, the data has gone out, um, and the former employee has just ignored your attempts to resolve the situation, uh, you hope that in a rare number of cases, you end up in that litigation, the very end of the point of the triangle. Okay, so what are these, we, 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 I said earlier, we sort of broke up these uh, tools into what we're calling the legal and the practical, or the legal tools and the real world tools. So uh, the legal tools, these are things, I think I said, that, that judges and lawyers love. Um, we love written contracts. So um, in litigation, what you'll find is that in a case where the plaintiff can demonstrate that the defendant, the, the alleged misappropriator of the secret information, was subject to a non-disclosure agreement. In those cases, the plaintiff is far more likely, in fact, I think the statistic is 25 times more likely, to succeed in an argument that they took reasonable measures to protect the trade secret. In, in, the, in the legal realm, the presence or absence of an NDA can be the most important factor to the point where it eclipses all of the others. And as I said, this is because lawyers and judges, they just love written agreements. They love seeing an NDA. And if there's an NDA in place, the presumption is, well, the employee agreed that they would keep this, conf this information confidential. And if they don't, they're in breach of their NDA. So that's a very important, from a legal perspective, it's a very important tool. It's extremely important. And then these others are similarly, in terms of litigation preparation, these are very important. As I said, considering non-compete agreements, which uh, are legal agreements that prevent, in some jurisdictions, employees from moving from one company to a competitor, um, imposing the same types of restrictions that you impose on your own employees, imposing those same restrictions on vendors, ensuring through covenants with your partners that they are also imposing NDAs on their own people, that they're imposing non-compete agreements on their own people. And then finally, this is the, uh, the picks or it didn't happen rule, which is all of this is great, right? I mean, you can have you can have everybody sign an NDA, but if you can't find the NDA when your outside counsel needs it to go file a lawsuit, it's not going to be worth much. 
Um, and you can have everybody uh, go through training, confidentiality training, secrecy training. It's not going to mean anything if you can't show that the particular defendant in your case sat through the training and acknowledged the training. So um, as a litigator, from a litigator's perspective, this is one of the more important things that th these things, processes and policies are all great, but they don't mean anything unless we can prove it in court. Uh, and so documentation is key, ensuring that you have copies of the NDAs, probably the most basic copies of the NDA, uh, but also that you have records of all of these other things uh, that we're gonna talk about, including the practical measures. Having those records is extraordinarily important in litigation. Okay, so these are all the legal tools. These are the things that if you end up in a litigation, you're gonna be really hoping that you have in place. Let's talk about what we're calling real world tools. And these are the tools that, you know, look, it's great if you are in a, if you, if you have the unfortunate circumstance of being in a litigation, you will be very happy that you have all those legal tools in place. But what we're talking, one of the things we're talking about today is ensuring that we never get to that point, right? That we never make it to that point of the triangle. And instead we prevent or, or um, stop misappropriation before it happens and before we get to litigation. So here, Dave, I'm gonna queue up, or I'm gonna pivot to you to talk about some of these real world tools um, and particularly the role of technology in ensuring that trade secrets remain protected and they don't, they're not uh, exfiltrated in the first place. Thanks, Greg. Um, so as a as an in-house practitioner, I absolutely want to avoid litigation. Um, and my focus is really around preventing the IP from leaving the enterprise in the first place. And to the extent that it does, shifting, shifting left. So detecting uh, and remediating that situation as quickly as possible. On the flow chart that Greg showed, uh, the incident detection box, which we highlighted in red for a reason, um, oh, thank you, is because it's of interest to this group, of course, but it also, it determines what happens after. So if the incident is detected quickly, um, how this flow chart ultimately plays out is very different than if an incident is detected weeks, months, or sometimes years after the, the exfiltration. So this is really a key step and a key focus for those who are charged with protecting a company's IP. Um, so there's all sorts of technical, technical solutions that do various things to help protect um, IP. Of course, source code repositories are a big one. Um, uh, access controls uh, and permissions are very important. Um, something that I've lived through, uh, not here, but I've lived through, um, and just a sort of practical point on access controls, they need to be revisited all the time because um, when you're a startup, everybody has access to everything because they need access to everything. And then the business evolves and moves out of that startup stage. And often... Those settings aren't 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 um, changed, and so everybody still has access to everything, even if they don't need it. And so that really, from a from a practical perspective, that needs to be revisited as the company evolves. From a legal perspective, if it's it's harder to make an argument that something is a trade secret and that you're taking reasonable steps to protect it as a secret if access to it is broad and is beyond the, that set of people that need access to it. Um, and then there are tools that, that, that detect exfiltration in real time or in near real time. 
and enable the security team in concert with legal and with HR and, um, and IT often to, to take action, to, to do something um, to, to recover the IP before it um, really gets into the wild and becomes uh, very damaging. In terms of process, um, you know, we talked about limiting control uh, and ac uh, li limiting access. It's very important. Um, it, it just, the people who need access to trade secrets and need access to confidential information should have it, but those that don't shouldn't. And it's, it's, um, it's just a, it's a living, breathing thing, and it needs to be maintained that way uh, and revisited periodically to make sure that it's scoped correctly. Um, Let's training... say one thing about that. Um, sorry, Dad, I didn't mean to cut oh, you no, off. Oh, no, go for it. Just, go ahead. I, something occurred to me. So in terms of litigation, we love when you have the, the crown jewels that have been misapproved. We love to, to say as litigators, well, Judge, you know, only five people in the company had access to this. It was That's how important it was. But in terms of just real life, in terms of practical ability to to take something out of the company, if you don't have access in the first place, you can't take it. And we've seen some really interesting high profile events in the last few years, whistleblowers um, and um, people, you know, obviously we have this national security um, issue recently where uh, apparently like an IT analyst had access to all of this very, very sensitive um, data. And, you know, it's interesting, it's a good lesson for, well, it's a good lesson for national security, but it's a great lesson for uh, companies who are dealing with their own sensitive information to ensure that the people who are, uh, who have access to the material absolutely need to have access to it and ensure that the people who are uh, enabling that access, you know, that their access is, is controlled as well. And I think Dave, your point is exactly right, that when you start up, when you just have five people at the company, it's easy to just have every, everyone's access to everything. Um, but once you grow and be, you become, you know, a very large or even not even that large, you know, as soon as you grow beyond five people, you really need to revisit that, um, that initial thinking of let's share everything with everyone because you just never know. Thanks, Greg. Um, in terms of training and exit interviews, th this is really goes to culture. This really goes to creating a culture of um, a security culture, a culture of respecting IP, a culture of protecting the company's crown jewels and competitive advantages. Uh, tr these are not, tr so training should not be a one-time event. It should be regular. Um, policies around security, around data stewardship, around access controls, also are living, breathing things, and they should be revisited periodically as well. Um, and in terms of exit interviews, you know, this is, it's always a good opportunity to remind somebody of their obligations as they walk out the door and uh, reinforces that the company takes this really seriously. Um, don't have to be mean about it. It's just simply reminding people that they have ongoing obligations to the company of confidentiality. And a great opportunity to get their stuff back, right? You know, and a great opportunity, if they have not returned it, yes, to get their stuff back, yes. And I think you you hear that a lot in these cases that um, the in, during the exit interview process, that was when the employee, you know, the best case scenario is that's when the employee says, you know what, I, I need to tell you, I have another laptop that you guys never picked up. Um, that's a case that will never make it to me, um, where you, by doing the exit interview and walking through that checklist and saying, did you return all of your devices? Oh, you know, yes, I have an iPad back at my house. I need to bring that in. That's great, because then the thing doesn't go out into the wild with your data on it. Um, you'll notice that I didn't talk about NDAs and I didn't talk about restrictive covenants, not because I disagree with Greg. Um, you know, most technology companies, most companies with IP will enter into uh, NDAs as a matter of course with everybody. And 
um, and some will enter into restrictive covenants with, uh, with certain employees. The reason I didn't mention them is because they're contractual. So these are promises that people are making and they're not automatic. So they don't kick in. The, the NDA doesn't somehow reach out a big arm and grab the IP and bring it back. You have to enforce it. And so then you're on the flow chart um, and, and, or some version of the flow chart to enforce that contract and recover your IP. So I don't mean to suggest that they're not important, but they are imperfect solutions to this problem. Um, and then the last point, and I know we're running short on time, the last point really is, as a practical matter, you know, protecting IP and security is absolutely a team sport. Um, it, it really involves close coordination um, between the legal folks, security, HR, IT. It's, it is a for all of these activities and all of these things that are listed here, these are group team exercises. Uh, it's it's impossible these days to do this sort of stuff and um, and and really adequately protect IP with people operating in silos. Um, and you know, a number of these things, incident response in particular, these things need to be practiced. They need to be um, incident response is not just a policy that sits in the pos you know, in the internal policy repository to be pulled out when there's an incident. Really need to practice this stuff. Um, and then lastly, it requires a real commitment from the leadership of the company as well. And I'll say, as outside from the out outside council perspective, it is such a joy when you're working on a case like this and you have that collaborate, you, you can see the collaboration in the company where there's not the, there's no silo between legal and IT or, or legal and information security. Um, that when, you, when those teams are functioning well and working or HR, and when those teams are functioning and working together, um, you can achieve amazing things. When the most frustrating thing maybe as outside counsel is when those things aren't, when those functions are not functioning together. And it's, you know, well, we did an exit interview, but IT um, didn't get the memo and returned this person's laptop to service and we've lost all the potential forensics. That That is so frustrating. <laughs> you know, it's like somebody has highlighted this as a potential issue, but nobody thought to communicate that to the people who could actually help. That is horrifying. So, uh, you know, Dave, is, you're absolutely right. Like we we can all do better, but this this one, making sure that every all of these various functions and stakeholders are invested in this together um, is going to will dramatically increase compliance and dramatically decrease the the number of instances where you're going to need to go into litigation. Wow. So thank you very much, Greg and David. Appreciate your insight on this here. Um, I think that uh, they've they've kind of really given us an idea of, of I don't want to use the word horrors, but the impact to an organization of of having to of having to go through litigation and, and hinted a little bit about what really should be happening to avoid this. And so Thank you guys uh, for this, and we'll bring you guys back um, uh, at the end. Had some interesting co questions already come up, so we'll bring you back at the end and, 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 and go through some of those to open the dialogue. So I'm going to introduce Eric Ewald now. Eric is, um, again, from Booz Allen, and Eric's going to talk a little bit more deeper on that movement to the left, as uh, Greg kind of hinted at. Eric can come back on uh, camera, um, hinted at around, what do you do to really build these programs out and these policies out to do, you know, avoid what, what they talked about from a, from a litigation standpoint. So uh, Eric, thank you very much. Thank you, Matt. <clears throat> so why are we here? Practitioner perspectives on IP theft and really focusing on collaboration is, is the key kind of enabler to, to your effective uh, management of IP kind of centric risk. So uh, about me, hi, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. 
Uh, Eric Ewald, I'm a uh, senior associate and chief engineer with our cyber technology solutions group here at uh, Booz Allen Hamilton. Uh, want to thank David and, and Greg for taking time out of their busy days to offer the legal perspective. Uh, lots of nuggets of wisdom in there. Um, honestly, that last slide that, that they presented prior to the question slide, um, if anyone wants my input, I would say that you need to go ahead and, and print that one out, put it on your desk if, if this is the area where you work. So, um, okay, a little bit about me. Um, today, I'm actually in a, a booze, booze office, but uh, I have been operating out of my home office where much of you, like much of you, um, I've been inevitably detained uh, thanks to a global pandemic. Uh, definitely fun times. Um, I've been working in the, the insider threat, insider risk management, and kind of information protection space since 2017. I was fortunate enough to transition out of um, a non-cyber role into cyber. Um, prior to that 2017 timeframe, uh, I spent more than a decade in finance and accounting and audit roles. I got to see kind of the inner workings of the casino gaming industry <clears throat> and also learned what really makes a, a global financial institution tick. My, my final role, ooh, I think we got, we got ahead of ourselves. Um, my final role in, um, in internal audit was very heavily focused on analytics which is really kind of where I started to understand the types of logging and telemetry and, and artifacts that cre get created by software applications and, and the platforms that operational teams use in the conduct of, of everyday business. Uh, I built specialization acquiring that data from virtually any structured format or other. This is a, something like ODBC connectivity to a database, but also um, custom mapping PDFs to pull in data that was, was kind of printed by a system all of these logs, all that information was used to identify risk or in some cases quantify risk as, as key risk indicators. And really in that inter internal audit sense, I was building assurance-based detections. Um, ultimately, instead of sampling like you know, 30, 30 entries for a monthly control, I would look at an entire year's worth of transactions and, and evaluate that, that population pro programmatically. Um, transitioning into cybersecurity in the same company where I worked internal audit gave me a significant advantage um, because I landed on an insider team that was, was POCing UBA technology. I already understood how the business worked. I knew a lot of the players, people who approved journal entries and trial balances and the teams that owned things like payables and receivables, operational leaders. That intimate knowledge of business operations <clears throat> um, that perspective that I gained as a practitioner in internal audit was immediately applicable to my, my insider work in cyber. Uh, so really fast forward to today, I'm able to take all of that experience, uh, that intimate understanding of really how a business operates, and I bring that to bear for our clients, um, building insider risk programs, IP security programs, and, and really helping them manage risk more holistically. So with that kind of credentialing formality out of the way, um, we're going to get down to really why you joined, and we're going to we're going to spend some time here again from the practitioner's perspective, talking about about trade secret time. Where does that take us? We're going to set the stage. Uh, lots of risks, big picture things. Um, what's driving the increased risk? Uh, is it real um, or is it fictitious? I think the answer is unequivocally yes. It, it is very much real. We look at our industry reports, uh, Code 42's 2023 data exposure report, Google had a 2023 insider threat report, um, reports like Verizon DBIR and DTEX's inside risk investigations report, all, all showing increases in the types of activity that we care about, trade secret theft, data exfiltration, theft of intellectual property. Um, <clears throat> thanks to ultimately the commercial availability and now recently viability, of generative AI models, right? We're, we're talking about OpenAI's ChatGPT, something like Google's Palm. Uh, I think Meta has Llama, which are all effectively large language models. These are cap capable of generating deepfakes, deepfakes um, mimicking things like biometrics and, and really crafting shockingly precise phishing emails. If you introduce concerns about quantum computing to the equation, especially with AI, right? We're talking about supercomputers and artificial intelligence. 
I, I think the negative impact to our industry could, could be significant. Um, as noted in the intro, I'm one of many, you know, full-time employees who, who work the vast majority of their time remotely. Um, we've pushed some workers back into to brick and mortar, kind of the proverbial office, office buildings. Um, that really increases the need for cloud enabled uh, communication and collaboration platforms that ultimately support this, this hybrid operating model. Um, employees everywhere, I mean, periodically myself included, I think uh, we get burnt out, right? And it's garnering a lot of attention in, in cyberspace because we, you know, on the practitioner side, right? We're defending our organizations and those organizations operate 24 by seven. So sustained burnout is, is really kind of morphing into to elevated levels of employee disengagement, that's going to increase our likelihood that some type of careless mistake or really unintended consequences is going to occur. Um, surviving the global pandemic, as, as I think we all have uh, since we're here, it really left an indelible impact on global cyber operations. And what we are seeing today in, in client organizations really is that everyone who didn't have adequate tooling or censoring in place prior to the pandemic they bought a security appliance, a tool, some type of widget to either plug known control gaps or, or gain visibility to at-risk user behavior, um, especially in those kind of cloud-centric collaboration environments. <clears throat> All that new telemetry is really inundated clients with both false and true positives, right? And the false positives are, are misconfigured, but the true positives that are not actionable really end up being, you know, something that is a, a drain on your overall productivity. Um, that's why we, we constantly talk about hammering home, you know, that, that business context piece. Um, other big picture risks, right? We talked about conflicts of interest. Um, I think everybody at this point understands what dual employment or like the popularized term is overemployment, but it, it requires us to look at employee pro productivity really along a spectrum. Um, Working remotely, employees are definitely less supervised, and that lack of supervision inherently creates an opportunity for remote workers to hold more than one full-time role. Um, I want to congratulate them. Part of me does for for that, you know, Herculean effort. Uh, I couldn't fathom having another full-time job, um, but the practical side of me really sees the the potential impact to to company IP, company trade secrets. Um, it's it's a considerable vulnerability we have to account for. Um, especially uh, critical at this point in time really is, is like the ripple effect that the war in Ukraine has had on, on, on geopolitics at, at that global stage, right? Developed nations are literally at war. Um, we're hearing Warren Buffett mention things like the potential for seismic activity in Taiwan should China move to, to try and gain, um, gain them as a territory, right? Um, Global powers, really, in this case, nation states are, are using this period of historical unrest to distract foreign companies long enough to siphon off trade secrets, valuable intellectual property that, that most organizations have spent decades and hundreds of billions of dollars creating. So that they themselves can rise to supremacy as that one true kind of global superpower. Uh, China's even going as far as removing legal red tape and roadblocks to IP theft by introducing legislation that introduces more ambiguity um, and it makes it easier for them to really justify that kind of threat in, in the interest of the nation. And it, and it sounds like hyperbole or some type of quip or witticism concerning like a fictitious Orwellian world, but this is this is the reality that we face every day. Um, and I, I think you all would agree that it, it genuinely is getting worse. So <clears throat> where does that take us? Again, we're talking about collaboration. Um, IP theft impacts the entire company. Um, it's something that we definitely have to remember, but for the purposes of this kind of convo, we're talking about impact and cost of IP theft. So we're gonna focus on that. Um, have a hypothetical timeline for a significant IP theft case or trade secret theft case. Uh, Greg and David shared, I think the median is somewhere at the beginning of my timeline, um, but again, for the full run of incident confirmed, and then I'm going to go to litigate, and then case is officially closed. We're going to, five years, five to six years is a pretty good ballpark. Um, focusing today, explicit costs and implicit costs, right? We have things that are above board. We all see them, we know them, they they happen. Um, 
Example one, right, technical investigative support. If you do not possess that capability within your company, um, you're going to have to go out to the market. You may have uh, a third party law firm on retainer, right? Those legal fees are going to start to rack up very quickly for any of us that have had the chance to personally work with lawyers, right? We know that they're not, not inexpensive. Um, changes to your, your cyber programs, your cyber operations, right? you're going to have to improve your resilience and and demonstrate that you can minimize, you know, the impact of this type of theft moving forward. We really joke always that nothing opens up the corporate checkbook quite like a significant case of, you know, cyber theft. Uh, we can add an audit finding or some type of new regulatory requirement to that as well. Um, investments of this nature, right? Uh, big picture transformational things. These these are these are going to cost your company money. Moving into protected space, right? Um, we're thinking about consumer facing companies. Uh, if protected data is stolen, right? We have to notify everybody that costs money. Um, you're gonna have to provide some type of protection to the consumers in this case. Um, think about your cyber or financial or identity protection um, for consumers and customers impacted. Uh, fines from regulatory bodies. Your regulator regulators will never not be there with their hand out, uh, especially if if they can kick you while you're down. And that's probably unfair, but that's at least my personal experience thus far. Um, PR, right? Your marketing teams, your communication teams are going to have to spin this or provide feedback to shareholders, to the board. Um, where do we go from here, right? We kind of have a second wave. So assuming that the time from, right, we're going to court, all of that hits the headlines, you're going to see legal fees and litigation impact again uh, down the road. We have, in some cases, expert witnesses that have to be retained to provide or support your position. Uh, and then again, PR nightmare is, is just going to resurface and we have to, we have to get through it. Bottom of, the to uh, bottom of our equation, right, operational disruption. Um, this is one of the first areas you're gonna see impact uh, just generally to company operations. It's gonna start with cyber. You have your teams managing IR, insider risk, IP protection, analysts, investigators. If this is a, a significant case, and again, like my, my peers said, we have to make sure that we, we have that very well defined. You're gonna activate some type of critical IP theft playbook. Uh, you're gonna start running through those plays. Updates to senior leadership, executive, C-suite are gonna happen on a specified frequency. We're gonna reach out to friends in the business, um, hammer out like, extremely specific details about the case, about the data. That's gonna depress productivity to the point where it could become material, right? Market perception, opportunity cost of losing customers, um, lots of different things uh, are effectively wave one. And then in the middle, right? Uh, it's it's a reaction. By this time, we may have filed a claim with our insurance provider. Anybody that's had uh, had a wreck with their own personal insurance, right? You know that in some cases your premiums are going to go up. It's the same for corporations. Um, the company's ability to raise capital in in a economically efficient way could be impacted, right? It's good. your your credit rating quite candidly could change. That, that the cost to borrow money would go up. <clears throat> that's going to get passed along to your customers. Um, lots of literature supports that, you know, victim organizations can potentially face those higher interest rates. But we also have to think about refinancing existing debt. If you have significant amounts of debt, you're, you're going to be subject to higher. Um, you're going to be in a higher risk borrower category and, and subject to those rates. Um, but really, like, why are we talking today? I have loss of competitive advantage in the middle. You really don't know when it's going to happen. And it's extremely difficult to quantify. Um, theft of IP really is taking away your business's ability to compete in that global marketplace of today. And, and without some type of copycat product or an announcement from a competitor, new entrant to the market, it's going to be extremely difficult to make, right? Um, but again, we're cognizant of it and we keep marching, marching forward. Much like the top side of our equation, right? We have, uh, we have kind of round two. Operational disruption happens again. Right, we have to control, we have PR up top, we're, we're controlling that reputation, that market perception. But again, customers or partners that we gained from the time we announced the litigation to when it's going to go to trial and we have a new kind of spate of notifications, um, there's a potential that they could sever ties. So, so really when you look at like all of this together and if you start to assign dollar amounts to it, 
Um, I think Code 42's data exposure report said something like $16 million for the average significant IP theft case. And again, based on what uh, David and Greg shared, that's that's value in excess of 25 million, right? Because I think the amount there was like seven and a half million per case. So 50 million, 15 million, uh, and it keeps multiplying up. Again, I think I said at the very beginning of this slide, erosion of competitive advantage is gonna impact the entire company, the enterprise and all employees. If your company can't go to market and make money, they can't pay your salary, which, which is not a great place to be in. Um, wow, aren't we lucky that our friends in the SEC have finally handed uh, cybersecurity IP protection insider risk programs an opportunity to develop deeper ties within the organization um, with executive leadership, board of directors, C-suite. These, these proposed regulations um, for publicly traded companies are, are gonna mandate the filing of an amended form 8K. And again, we're talking about materiality. Um, which is a, a brand new concept. It's a loss significant enough to impact your financials. So it's it's a moving target for organizations. It's based on how much money you make in general. Um, what are they going to want to know in this amended 8K, right? We need to know when the incident was discovered, whether it's ongoing. Um, we're going to look to whether any data was stolen. Uh, it wasn't manipulated or abused, right? Some type of unauthorized access or use. Uh, description of right, nature and apparent magnitude of, of the incident in total, whether the registrant has remediated or is, is still in the process of kind of remediating the, the incident, and then the overall effect on, on the registrant's operations, like is it going to hit your bottom line? What, kind, what types of data? Again, um, practical application, right? We have broad trade secret definitions. Um, Critical business intelligence, right? Your vendor lists, um, different information price lists that are in SAP, or in some cases, uh, a list of all your fully qualified domain names, a list of P addresses to all of your your um, your servers and assets. It's going to be a significant problem. Source code is what it is. Uh, I think we we realized in the prior session we, we can kind of shape those definitions of what a trade secret is so again for companies like chat gpt who are standing up applications and and bringing things to bear or bringing things to market um it's significant uh again ai models algorithms uh formulations for friends in pharma or biopharma friends in life sciences but also um in some cases uh consumer goods your Coca-Cola formula. Um, David and Greg also mentioned design records, design methods. These things are very, very appealing, but also like don't overlook the M&A and business development activity. We still have insider trading concerns that we're trying to mitigate. And again, we, we want to make sure that that information is protected. It may not meet that trade secret or IP theft level, but it could be extremely detrimental. Um, where do we go from here? Um, in the world of consulting, clients ask us every day, like, what should we be doing now? Or how can we get better? What can we accomplish with technology or resourcing that we have in place? Uh, what they're really asking is, how can we do more today? How can we, we, and what steps do we need to take to enhance protection of trade secrets and valuable business IP? So to answer these questions, um, we're gonna walk through an exercise that our friends on the data security side within my commercial practice are, are quite fond of. And it's something that we've extrapolated for, for insider risk purposes. We're, we're looking across multiple dimensions, right? How do you understand exposure? We can't even get to the next steps um, unless we really break it out and run through each of these different dimensions. Um, First, we're looking at identifiability, right? If a user comes across the information, no pretense, no prior knowledge, like what would they be looking at? Uh, would they know what it is? Would they be clueless? And, and again, this spider chart is one through five, five being on the outside, and then this inner ring is one. So it's a, a one increment each, each, each level. So we're going to evaluate identifiability. <clears throat> we're going to look at prevalence in your environment. Um, this is ultimately kind of the internal digital risk landscape. Is it behind a lock and key? 
Is it is it protected by physical barriers, or is this something that is so pervasive it's it's shared uh, broadly on, in emails and stored locally? Uh, exposure. When we get to that point, we want to capture how many people have access to this information. That spectrum starts with one person, five people. I think was the example um, from from Greg, but. The other end of the spectrum is this information is so pervasive that everybody has access to it or it's shared externally, right? With multiple vendors, multiple business partners. Um, the evaluation ultimately ends with business impact. If there's nominal impact of the business, we're gonna assume that the information landing in a competitor or threat actor's hands would have little or no impact uh, on business operations. Excuse me, the other end of that spectrum is mission critical operations are literally halted which is scary to think about, but absolutely why this exercise should should be run through with that kind of cross-functional or collaborative, collaborative group, um, which is one of the reasons why it's of vital importance that you, IP or insider risk defenders uh, or cybersecurity analysts, you have to work across sometimes siloed business operations. We have to ensure that we're aligning our resources with initiatives that really matter, right? These are things that um, significant organizational initiatives. And it's a word of wisdom that I give new stage programs, or early stage insider programs, is that if you can kind of hitch your wagon to a more significant organizational initiative, a big picture ESG initiative, et cetera, it's going to be easier to justify the expenses um, for your program. And again, if, if you're able to affect change on that level, um, you, you're going to be able to sustain that program. Um, we also have to ensure that we're responding with that unilateral support. Again, collaboration, cross-functional. We're talking multiple groups uh, from your legal organization, right? Labor and employment, if we have to have to exercise, exercise some type of employee action. Um, patent, patent or IP counsel. We have reminder letters and certifications. Again, attestations that information was destroyed. Uh, and, and last, but it's really not least, we have to drive much more secure work habits. Um, we need to push our organizations overall to work in a more secure manner. Early stage IP security or intellectual property security and insider programs, if we're looking at alerts, affect the, somewhere in the range of 65 to 75% of the alerts that they're going to see in that early stage program are going to be people that didn't know that they could, right? And you're going to hear that a lot. It's not something fun that you want to hear. Um, but ultimately, we have to anticipate the business's needs. And, and what we're doing is we're working towards securing the entire end-to-end -end value proposition. How does your company make money? What does it use to make money? Is it an algorithm and an application um, that's not the core widget that you sell that makes you all the money? Who knows, right? But you have to collaborate with the business. Um, you want to make information protection a business imperative before it... <laughs> ultimately before your ability to generate revenue becomes impaired, um, which I think is something we would all concur is of value. The culmination of our discussion, right? Uh, those are some kind of practical steps for starting today or doing more today. How do we drive that collaboration? Um, we, look at, we look at activity along the spectrum. Uh, where our orange, our orange circle between detection and response is effectively when we find the bad. We want to shift clients left. We want to focus on that procedural governance oversight. We're talking access controls, classification, all of that detail. Um, I think everybody would love to be able to quantify the degree to which their IP security or insider program is, is mitigating a tangible or quantified business risk. And I don't know about you, but I would love to, if I was in the practitioner, practitioner perspective, I would love to share information like that with, with my, my C-suite, right? This is what I'm doing. I can actually show you that I'm reducing this. Um, so we're gonna walk through again, how do we get from governance all the way through recovery and improvement? And, and we're gonna measure risk at, at that first level. So if we kind of plot it on a map, this is what everybody wants to see. Uh, we want to see risk go down, but how do we do reduce risks? So from and from the perspective of holistic insider risk management, IP security, we can reduce our observed levels of risk by injecting 
valuable business context into all facets of our work. Well, now, what does that really mean? So if we look at the bottom duration, we're talking about sprints or PIs, let's say, let's say sprints. Assume that in sprint one or two, you have your first stakeholder hub meeting, your first kind of collaborative working group meeting. Um, we have representation from the business, we have legal. Um, the business, again, in this example, is your revenue generating functions, the people, the processes in your organization where sensitive IP, trade secrets, and, and critical business intelligence is used to support mission critical or day-to-day -day business ops. Um, that primary pur purpose of that hub meeting is governance and oversight, but the secondary purpose in very, very close second is developing that valuable business context, right? And again, these are in that conversation, things that would come up, right? You might be talking about, I have, I'm inundated with alerts. And then you have somebody pipe up like, uh, you mentioned you're seeing increased levels of data exfil. Um, I'm not certain that everything that you highlighted is bad from a business perspective. What, what we do have is a list of vendors that are approved to receive um, confidential information or above. Like, would that help? Would that provide value to you? Um, other things, we're getting pressure to reduce our cloud data footprint footprint. This is a question from the business, right? Uh, are you able to tell us how much information we have in the cloud? How quickly information is being created in the cloud, right? These are concerns like we can use that information as currency. Um, another thing, right? Business perspective, like, whoa, hey, we worked with our BSOs to log an exception request for controls on that specific application that you guys are seeing problems with. Um, we're actually in the process of standing up the replacement if you want us to, we can loop you in. We're going to ensure that we design and build that app with, with security in mind, right? Each of those exchanges, every comment or connection that you make with your business is going to increase your program's context, but it also positions governance solidly as a pillar within your program. And again, like you ask the business, and if you ask them, in most cases, they're going to tell you. Um, with governance comes opportunities to protect your business's critical IP, Right, uh, you build rules into CASB, email system, DLP that restrict movement, uh, tagged information. In many cases, we're trying to prevent this unplanned leakage or exfiltration. The business intel, again, that you gained um, from protecting that information is naturally gonna wait, make its way into your detections and, and ultimately inform the priority of your response. How do you know that you're detecting and responding to what really matters to your business? Again, like we have those meetings, we ask them, what should we protect? And they told you, your initial focus on governance, right? That heavy stakeholder engagement, um, it's gonna help you develop trust, establish that rapport very quickly. And in turn, like the hope is that they're gonna let you into their world. Um, so what does increasing context do? Increasing context, when we introduce that, when we put a supplier list or we put a, a list of people that have access to sensitive IP, right? We're gonna elevate the fidelity of our detections and really at the end of the day what's that going to do it's going to reduce our our level of effort we're going to be able to get through things more quickly and and cover a lot more ground so again this is kind of an academic perspective on on how we get from left to right or how we shift left and really focus on governance and then follow that through the process but um i think the the primary takeaway is uh, especially in in the land of ip security trade secret theft, you, you have to work extremely closely with your legal friends, which is again, why, why I'm speaking alongside, um, alongside some esteemed legal professionals. Um, they're gonna help you understand what you need to understand within the context of your business. And then again, hopefully provide you with, with valuable feedback that can set you on the right path. So Matt, I think that's-, that's Eric, the, thank you very much for that. That that last um, slide of, of just injecting context um, and fidelity into, into the conversation, but into your process and into your program, I, I think is very critical. So I'm gonna ask David and Greg to join us. We've got a number of questions that have come up here that I think could be interesting to have the team uh, join in on, on, on the conversation. Um, please make sure you're, 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 these are not just, even if I might introduce the question to one of you, feel free to, to kind of add if, if, if you've got an opinion about something, but, um, one of the things, Greg, that, that became apparent that all three of you really highlighted was how expensive both financially and operationally litigation is at the end of the day. 
Uh, and so one of the questions that comes up is, if an event has happened, is there are there other alternatives to pursue to avoid the litigation? Eric talks about, and we talked about preventing that event itself, but if a security event does happen, are there secondary options that an organization can pursue to avoid to avoid that litigation process that you just described? It's a great question. Um, I spend a lot of time counseling clients um, on how to avoid litigation in situations like that, where you have a former employee or a business partner. You know, it's not always employees, but you have some way that your confidential information or trade secrets have walked out the door. Um, proverbially, and you uh, you want to get them back, right? Most most clients are not looking for litigation; they want to get their information back, and they want to they want assurances that whoever took it is not going to use it or couldn't use it in the future. So, one of the techniques we use we talked about this in our triangle and some other places is trying to resolve informally through um, letter writing and through uh, you know, once you get that dialogue going through getting a certification from your uh, potential defendant that they haven't used the information, they're going to give it back. Often then what occurs in, in these cases is you you want some verification, right? You want to trust the person because they were your former employee after all. And, you know, you have a relationship with them. You think this person probably is not going to take my information. But, you know, we're always in the land of trust, but verify. Right. Make sure you get those certifications. That's great. But getting in there uh, and getting some forensics done on the potential defendant's computer can be can go so far in just diffusing one of these situations. Often, you know, every defendant is going to say they didn't take the stuff or they didn't mean to or they had no intention of doing anything wrong or they didn't realize that it was proprietary, whatever. Everyone has a story. But um, in the end, the facts don't change, right? If they, if they uploaded the information to a new company's systems, or if you've got forensics that show that after they left the old company, they were accessing and using the information, those facts are um, negative, right? That might push you towards litigation. But in, in many of these cases, you, you have employees, especially now, Especially now, in the old days, you used to have to like tuck the trade secrets into your pants or something and walk out in the middle of the night. You don't have to do that anymore. I mean, like you can just you, you're working from home. You can download tens of thousands in some systems if they're not you know carefully locked down. Some employers can allow their employees to just download wholesale amounts of data um, and and may never even know what happened. So. What you see now is employees who have backup systems like OneDrive or Carbonite or something like that, where you know they are in, in complete good faith, just trying to do their job and ensure that they're able to keep you know, doing their work. And in the meantime, without even thinking about it maybe, are just copying thousands of files, all kinds of proprietary information into a cloud account. And then they leave. And if there's, you know, mistrust, that can look very, very, very bad. But, um, you know, this is what I, this is what I mean about the forensics, right? Is in that situation, if you go in and get forensics, and you can show as a defendant, well, look, yeah, I have all this stuff, but I, I haven't, I didn't even realize I had this backup. I haven't touched it. I haven't opened it. That's great, right? That can completely diffuse the situation and avoid what will, ult what could ultimately be a very unsatisfying and expensive litigation, especially where the the defendant that, it's funny because that was one of the other questions that came in is is that um it, it it depends on whether there's proof that they actually used it to 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 you know for their advantage or some other advantage to 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 actually have a solid case is that is that an accurate statement well let me say something that i should have said earlier that <laughs> uh, the express the uh, opinions expressed during this presentation are not those <laughs> of greenberg Tvarig or right. any of our clients right um at, this is an extremely insightful question from anonymous attendee. Thank you, anonymous yeah. attendee. Yeah. Um, you know, this question of whether there needs to be proof of use of the information in order to launch a litigation. You know, it's a it's a very fact dependent question. Uh, it's a very lawyerly answer, right? It always depends. It depends. 
but it does. I mean, right, you, you could have an employee who leaves and you have all of this rock solid evidence that they've taken information, right? They downloaded information. They did it on their last day. You know, it looks very bad. But the, the fact is to prove ultimately misappropriation, you have to show more than that. You have to show that they use the information for some purpose, you know, for their own purposes or for a competitor's purposes, uh, or that they disclosed it without your permission. And so it's entirely, po and you have case law that, that says this, it's not really possible to download information. And, and the backup hard drive example I was spinning out is a great example of this, that you could download a lot of information and not even realize that you have it. And it just sits on a backup hard drive somewhere and you never use it. Well, um, that may not be, that may technically be a misappropriation, but one that you know couldn't support a damages claim, for example. Um, and in some jurisdictions under some law, that's not even a misappropriation, right? That's not even breach of your employment agreement necessarily. So it depends. And the reason that we do some of this pre-suit investigation is to try to ensure that especially as outside counsel, right? You don't want to go into court and tell a judge, like we have all this great evidence and then have nothing. That, that, that's not a good look. So you're, you want to ensure that you've got evidence of that. But I mean, I, I think pra everyone understands this. Practically speaking, it's very difficult to know what anyone did with the information, right? I mean, you only have a very limited window forensically into what happened. You, you could see that it's taken, but it's almost, well, depending on the tools, right? There are some ways to see where, where data is being used. But in most instances, it's going to be impossible to know what the person did with the information. And so this pre-suit investigation can ultimately be very valuable, either for avoiding litigation entirely, because you learn that the potential defendant really had no intention of using the information. Or on the other side, this happens all the time, you send a letter saying, hey, by the way, we saw it, we did this investigation, we saw this, we saw this. And then you just get a response that confirms your worst suspicions, right? It's like if the person responds, says, oh, that's mine. You know, I, I invented that. That's my, my IP. It's not yours. Well, now you're off to the races, right? Now you can go in and say to the judge, look, we've got forensics that show the person took the information. Their response demonstrates their intention to, to use it. And, and here we go. Right. So anyway, that's a long-winded way. Of uh, saying no, no, that's that. valid. I, I think that I think the two questions were 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 very closely aligned. And um, but I'm going to switch gears a little bit from the the lawyerly conversation. And in in Eric, Eric in Greg and David's presentation, they had that inverted triangle, and at the top was actually technology and controls. You talk about people process or technology would you agree that technology is first or how would you rank if you talk about people process technology on what you should be looking at initially when you're when you're laying out kind of that pro that program interesting i think if you have no technology to prevent badness from happening i think it's a great opportunity up front to invest um, but I would quickly pivot to focusing on people and process, right? Like I think we've all mentioned, uh, or at least tried to hammer home, we're, we're talking about cross-functional support, and we can't necessarily enable that with technology alone. Um, that cross-functional support, the investment in people and process is also going to enable your technology to be more effective, right? You're going to have more complete business information when you're going into that acquisition of a piece of technology. And again, it's the investment up front in people and process, you're, you're going to know the types of technology that's going to work ultimately um, prior to moving down that road. Um, does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to, I'm going to bridge that because you mentioned collaboration, you mentioned work groups, you guys mentioned, David, you said this is a team sport as, as inside counsel, general counsel, David, but not really responsible on the insecurity in or HR how do you view your role in in that team sport, right? In in being that part on the legal side, but how do you look at working with HR or the IT or the security as part of a, a team? And what situ scenarios have you seen in your career where that maybe didn't work very well and what could have been, been different? Well, we have a process. It's not a complicated one, but it's, you know, we have a process in place. Um, to surface incidents, and thankfully there have been very few here, but incidents that are of a severe enough level that 
somebody other than us, you know, our security team needs to know about it. I mean, the vast majority of these situations are handled at the security analyst level by reaching out to the person as, you know, Greg talked about, um, not even with a letter, just, you know, phone call, email, hey, we noticed this. And more often than not, the person is is surprised and mortified and embarrassed because they didn't mean to take it and it uh, it resolves. Um, for those matters that don't resolve that way, uh, we do have an escalation path um, that we've worked out between legal security and HR, um, where you know the incident will escalate through the security team. And if it reaches a point where we really need to bring in HR and legal to 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 figure out what our next steps are. Um, then it gets it gets um, brought to my attention and to our HR leaders' uh, attention. But we we collaborate. I mean, we collaborate. That's not an incident, but we collaborate really closely on all of the stuff that comes before. Right. Right. So, right? We that collaborate was- on policy development, the process development, um, you know, the communication muscles, we exercise those muscles. So, and it sounds like a lot, it's not a lot, it's not hard. It's just, it's it's important to do. I I was going to bridge that. I was glad you said it that way. Cause, cause again, Eric talked about shifting left in that continuum of his and you, you just shifted us left in saying, in saying, it's not the the problem here if you do the work here first. And Eric, in your experience in helping clients who 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 aren't necessarily doing this well, what have you seen? Some of the things that they can think about from building these work groups, developing these these policies and and these procedures, and having the dialogue internally that maybe they haven't historically had before. Um, great question. Uh, so when we work with clients that don't have any of this in place, um, we do harp on that education component, right? We, we focus on training, but we also have to educate the lawyers, right? Your labor and employment counsel, your privacy counsel, your executive IP counsel, they may have no idea what DLP is. They may have no idea how far those capabilities go. And then from a visibility perspective, they don't know what you can see. Right. So sitting down with them, walking through that type of stuff in a in a hub meeting, stakeholder working group, some type of collaborative forum, um, we find tremendous benefits. And it's you can see if you're face to face, if you're in a room, right, you can see the aha moment kind of happen where you, where they go. You can see that. Right. Or you can block that more importantly. And, and again, everybody goes, wow, like. That really elevates our level of protection. Like we didn't know that we could do that. How, what else can we protect in this kind of fashion? So it's that's the the kind of value of those those conversations that I've seen from the client side, but also from the practitioner side, right? Heavy education component. Um, the previous executive IP counsel that I dealt with, he really did not know a ton about DLP. Didn't know a ton about right what we did. So we had to talk him through how we investigate, talk him through where we needed his support, where we needed to draft letters. Right. If we had to have some type of attestation or certification, does he have to witness it? Do we have to watch the destruction? Right. Those types of conversations um, provide maximum benefit. So I, I wanted to say the same thing, actually, that education is is has to be we should have this on the triangle. Right. The, the top of the triangle and maybe it doesn't work geometrically anymore. It's like a dot on top of the triangle. <laughs> but, it, you know, education is the thing that unlocks all of this. And, and this it sort of maybe is obvious to the people who have taken time to log in and watch this presentation that learning about what is possible is the first step, right? Learning about what's possible, what the, you know, Eric, it's a great example, right? Knowing that you can even do some of this stuff, you can see some of these things. Once you know that it's going to inform everything else. It's going to improve all of your other processes. If you don't know that that tools exist, if you don't know that they're out there, you're not going to know to ask to have them implement. Yep. And I think it's the flip is true too, right? That like, if you're not thinking about 
the as a as a trial lawyer, everything I do, all of my work is always thinking about backwards from trial. How am I going to prove this to a jury? And how do, what are the steps I need to take to get there? And there are many, right? It's like starting from incident detection, we got to be thinking about even from day one, hopefully we never get there. But if we do, how are we going to prove to a jury that this was uh, this was taken? And so the um, that's my perspective. But that's not everyone's perspective, right? Most people will never, ever have the, the um, fortune, I guess, of, uh, of appearing in court. And so the, you know, having these communications where you have legal and the, and the sort of legal perspective speaking to the, you know, information security perspective so that one knows what's possible in the other is so valuable. So, you know, we love doing presentations like this, right? We love going around and, and educating on the, the law that's available, the procedure to get through, uh, to get relief. You know, some of these other things we talked about is how unsatisfying litigation can be. Um, providing that education really opens up a dialogue and allows all of these various stakeholders to uh, improve their own processes. Even if you're not the lawyer, knowing the, knowing some of the law can really help improve, uh, you know, in your sort of part of all of this. So, you know, we love giving presentations like this. We love to do, uh, to have these conversations because it helps us do a better job when, you know, just like today, right? Eric, I, I, I have a question for you, which is, uh, I'm going to ask questions. Go My ahead. question for you, Eric, is, you know, you mentioned this idea of like getting too many false positives, right? It's like this idea that you've got, you're in the control room at Three Mile Island and the alarms are going off so frequently that you're not thinking about it anymore. What are, are there best practices for avoiding that and, and, and for sort of like tuning that in so that you're just detecting the stuff that you really want to deal with? Yeah. Um, best practice number one is, is I think it's, it's insider risk management of IP security is what, what's critical right? We have to understand what processes are critical, what information is critical, what applications are critical, because all of them may require elevated cyber protections. Like focusing on criticality is going to introduce context, right? We're going to know the applications. I'm going to be able to see where that information is coming from, like using, using a solution like Insider or right DLP. We're, we have that visibility. Um, yeah, I'm having a brain fart now. Um, I, I I think you 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 if you look at that final that your final slide, yeah. um, I, I think uh, Greg of of context fidelity, context and fidelity, context and to the extent that that you can really add context by doing what you described, Eric. That 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 it, identification up front and the, and it, but again, it all goes back to dialogue, right? It's the business. Then now you've got the business units telling you what is what is critical when what is important to the organization that 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 ultimately at the end of the day needs 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 the protection of 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 all of this so yeah and but more importantly like if you don't have any context everything is a fire if yeah. i don't know that file xyz is the most significant right i'm going to spend and even if you have super effective high quality detections right you're detect it's the code's configured correctly you're catching the things that you're configured to catch Right, it doesn't mean that you should be looking at. It, right, we we have to narrow that. Like we're 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 kind of taking the aperture and dialing it in on what we really care about the most. And again, if you establish your IP security, IP protection program from that perspective, right, we're we're focusing that aperture day one, so we can immediately tell our legal friends, right, this is our scope, and we're looking at this every day, every hour, because this information is so critical. Right. And then again, that context is these are the people that have access. This is these are the applications where it can be found. Right. These are the information repositories that we have in cloud or on prem where it lives. Right. You have all of that context. You know that when you see something is bad. Um, I well, could talk about the detections for hours. I, I was I was going to say we could keep going on forever because this this is obviously very important information, very important dialogue. Sometimes this part of these these events and these webinars is is even better and, and and more interesting and engaging. And we could we could just have one of these panel discussions um at, at this stage. But we're gonna wrap up as we're coming to the end of our time. Um I think we've covered all of the uh the questions that have come in through 
the, the, the QA. Thank you again for all of you who have joined today and who continue to join these events. Uh, look next for the one in June we have coming out that uh, I think we've brought all of the winners or some of the winners of, of the most recent Insider Risk Community Awards. Um, we'll be on a panel in June. It'll be interesting to see the kinds of conversations that they have. So thank you again for joining us. Thank you again, David and Greg and Eric for sharing your insight with us today. We, we, we really appreciate it. Thank you again. Take care. Have a great day. Bye.